Welcome to Interviews with Innocence, a podcast about spirituality, consciousness, and exploring the wisdom our children bring into this world. I believe that our very young children are our greatest teachers. After all, they're the masters of living in the present moment, bubbling in unconditional love, enjoying the messiness of life, and curious about the universe in all its dimensions. The pure essence that young children exhibit lives within all of us. My hope is that these interviews will help us discover, embrace, and connect with the sacred core of childhood that resides within each of our hearts. I am your host, Marla Hughes. Today, I am so excited to have Elle Alma here on the show all the way from Australia. For more than 30 years, Elle Alma has worked tirelessly as a counselor in the areas of relationships, grief, disability, and spirituality to bring comfort to her clients as they face hardship. She has been a strong and deeply involved advocate for traumatized adults and children during her career, even traveling to remote regions at times to counsel families through the grief associated with disabilities. Semi-retired, today she writes within the calm surrounds of her farm where she lives with her husband and her family. Welcome to the show, El Alma. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm wondering, do you have animals on your farm? We, yes, we have cows. You have cows. Um, yeah, because we're semi-retired, we're not running it uh, as we used to. Yeah. Yes, yes. I grew up in a farm in Indiana and, and we had pigs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was it was pretty wonderful. Well, I'd like to start um, our interview today a little bit differently, and it's with just a little excerpt from your from your book. So I'll go ahead and start. Like a crack of lightning on a stormy night, our souls spark life within us long before we ourselves arrive on Earth. In her debut book, Becoming Soul. Seven Steps to Heaven, author El Alma sheds new light on the spiritual, spiritual connection and inherent bond we have with our consciousness before it is ever paired with our bodies, and how our physical form only serves as a temporary vessel for our souls to ripen and grow. When our bodies have perished, our souls move gracefully forward and wait to come to earth in a new body once again. Before returning to earth, our souls understand we must endure seven stages of development, silence, hope, suffering, loss, survival, belief, and heaven. El Alma was inspired to write this book to share the reality of the soul with others, help them navigate their soul's journey and grow their faith in God as she has through life's challenges, including doubt, misfortune, grief, and loss to develop their souls. I just love that. So I wanted to, wanted to share that with the audience. You also say, I want readers to come to understand that their souls are not lost, that their souls are love, and that they have the courage to become their souls. So thank you. Thank you so much you. for that. So to begin the conversation, um, El Alma, I'd love for you to just tell us a little bit how you how you began on this journey. I know you actually began as a child. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yes, I did begin very early with my grandmother who raised me and she was very connected to the divine. And um, I grew up listening to her and her stories mm. and um yeah and, and then I could pass it down to my children yeah and I did what she did just kept it alive in my children and um yeah it, it became part of our life right and when you say she was really connected to the divine um what kind of were they mostly biblical stories or or how was it that she kept that so um you know that she made such an impact on you? What kinds of things did she do? I think it was just her. I don't remember many biblical stories from her, but it was how she spoke. It was how she treated people uh, with care. She listened to people. Mm -hmm. um, she was very gentle and yet very firm. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so I, I think I just absorbed her 
and her ways. Right. And she talked. She talked about Jesus as a a uh, friend. Yes. And, uh, and that's how I learnt from her. Right. Yeah. And who have been your greatest teachers along this path? Oh, I think my children um, have really taught me um, to remain open, and um, I learnt a lot from them as they were. They were little, they were innocent, they were uh, aware. Um, so, and then it, it came then that the uh, story of my daughter uh, who, who passed, um, I walked a very um, spiritual journey with her through um, uh, facing death and leaving her family. Um, yeah. And then... Um, I also have a son with a disability and I'm very much connected with him uh, on a spiritual level because he's so innocent himself and uh, he remains in that innocence and keeps me there too. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey, if it's not too personal, about with your daughter, the things that you shared and, you know, when she was when she was getting getting ready to pass? Yes, we, we um, made a decision together to be strong. Um, we, our souls knew what was happening. Um, we didn't talk about the physical uh, that much. We had to confront a lot of the physical that was happening to her. Um, but I... I I think it was the decision we made to keep each other strong. Right. Because uh, she knew that I was very, um, probably sensitive, if you like, yes. uh, to the whole thing. And I knew she was very sensitive, of course. And um, so, we, yeah, we respected that in each other. And yeah. we, we, we tended to rise above the daily things and stay in our souls and talk about our souls. And, um, yeah, and I, I used to say to her, it's not fair, you're going to get there first. And I thought I would, and you know, just those little things we communicated with mm -hmm. and and remained in that um, that spiritual journey, I call it, um, because we changed as we walked along together. As she got weaker and um, it, was re it really kept us... Uh, very, very strong together. We, we were always very close and um, we stood beside each other and, and, and she'd say, I've got it, Mum, or I'd say, I've got it, you know. Um, so that's how we walked the path. Right, right. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. And you speak about the knowing between a mother and child and I this is so true. I think all mothers know this, but how how a mom just knows in their heart that that they can connect with a child who, you know, if they have passed. And can you how do you connect with your daughter now? Because I know you very much do. Yes. Um, I see it as a uh, as a continuation of the relationship that we actually had. Mm -hmm. There'd be times where because she was busy with her children and there were times where I couldn't just ring her. I knew she was busy and I'd have to wait and vice versa. She used to do the same with me. And, um, yes, it's very much a, a sense of, uh, I, I think, that, um, as she was getting closer and she was going more into a coma state, the doctor said to me, have you said everything that you need to say to your daughter? I said, oh, no, no, but I'll, I'll just have to wait till she's ready when she gets home. She'll connect. Uh, and, and, and she has. Yeah. And it, it just, our relationship just continued in that same vein of always being able to connect with each other. Right. And, and I believe that um, that's, it, it's exactly the same because a, a mother and a child share so many intimate uh, ways of connecting 
they they connect through their touch, they connect through their their feelings, the hugs, the, without saying things. It's very unsaid, and just just the the um, knowing and the and the smells and all, all through the senses you you would feel your child you, you know you're wrapped up in a little blanket on your knee you, you can feel it and it just doesn't go away yes and and um yeah it, it's still the same it's just the same it's just I don't see her physically yeah but, but she's very much alive in um in in a spiritual sense yeah and that's that's just so incredibly beautiful and i know i say that a lot but i really mean it (laughs) and i know um that you say as i mentioned i want my readers to come to understand that our souls are not lost that our souls are love and they have the courage we have to have the courage to become our soul can you elaborate on this a little bit please yeah, I think we um, get to a stage in life where we um, tend to have to get out there into the world and we toughen up and we have to do a job. And even as a mother at home, you, you know, you, you have to get the jobs done and you have to push your children through school. And, um, but all the while, the child is, is very much in the soul. And this is, um, the mother is so aware of that as well that they can connect easily if they can calm down and and uh, reach their child at any time. And I think when, you know, it, it comes where people say, uh, oh, he's lost his soul or, um, you know, it, it's, it's not a thing that you can lose. It's something that's deep inside of you. And we only have to be touched by, by our children, by their pain or by and and something opens inside of us and um so it's always there we we just forget that we just forget that we've we walk each and every single moment of our lives with our souls and they're there ready to open when we're ready and things like the you know the death or the uh that opens you completely to your soul and and then you start living from there and then and all the um and there's moments in the day you know that things touch your soul and and uh but we're very vulnerable when we get to that point and i think uh, the, the fear comes in and not not to be too vulnerable and um you've got to protect yourself and but in reality um your soul is your protection right do you think that your grandma, you know, being such a, a divine being, because she chose love and she remembered and that growing up that way and also your beautiful son who is, as you say, he relates to Jesus as a boy and and he's a friend and loves and trusts him as a friend, which is oh, just is so so heartwarming do you think those things also helped you well even before your daughter passed just to Mm -hmm. be so I mean I can just hear the divine in you (laughs) and do do you feel like those sorts of things um I'm sure helped you oh it was my that was my grounding yeah Yeah, I don't I don't think I could have ever faced what I had to face right Uh, in such a spiritual way, um, if I didn't have that that uh, connection way back, and and it was it was just her blessings that she'd at me, of the uh, of the gentleness and um, and then having a gentle child uh, keeps 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 you gentle, and that's a choice then that you, you either want to remain that or you want to toughen up and get out there. I mean, there's two sides of me where I have been out in the world and I've had to, um, you know, run a, a counselling career and and be tough with people, but also with your soul has, has to be part of it because you're just not going to reach them 
if you if you because every everyone wants to be reached and to be loved and to be cared for and to be listened to. And I think that was what I learned through my childhood and then with through my children. And, and yes, I was prepared um, for, for the ultimate, which was something that I would never wanted in my life was to lose a child. Yes. And uh, it's, it was something that, that I was prepared for through the hardships of my life and through the love in my life and um yeah i think i think god prepares you what a message to all of us to humanity just you are a living example of what it's like to have parents caregivers family who have that gentleness and have that soulfulness and what what it's done for you you know, if mm-hmm. just all of us are can listen carefully and, and begin doing doing that with our young children. I think we all try, but I think that maybe we need to just try a little bit harder sometimes or, or not. I don't want to say it that way. That sounds judgmental, but but maybe spend a little more, bit more quiet time with ourselves, which brings me to the next question in our pre-conversation you said something that really touched me and you just talked about the importance of remembering. And this is for, for adults. And of course, children already (laughs) remember they're so close to the source. So can you tell us, talk a little bit about the importance of remembering and what this, um, what this can do for, do for us? Yeah, I think um, the example that I have in my mind is the as a child, um, you go to sleep, and you know, as a very young child, and you know you sort of uh, your parents are trying to get you to sleep, and then all of a sudden you go into this state where you're not listening to what's going on around you. And you see your child has moved into this sedate state, if you like. And you just sort of, okay, now let them be. But they're still awake, but they're lying there in this uh, in-between state. And um, that's them connecting to the divine. That's the divine with them. And that's what we know how to do this. We fight it, but we know how to do this. And this is what we try to do in meditation. We try to get back to that state. Where we're, we're the in between state, where we want to connect back to the divine, and we know we know from a child that just totally letting go and falling completely into the arms of the divine and trusting that, that you know that the phone's not going to ring or the that, that we can let go, and watching a child go to sleep, the innocence of that, and knowing that's their connection. That's what we want to get back to. That's what our remembering is, that we have to remember that that feeling, that state of absolute bliss, if you like, yeah. that, and that you then are connected to the vine. Everything that's happening around that child is not important to them. And for us to lie in that state and to get ourselves to that state, which is total trust that you can let go for a minute, and um, that's what we try to do every time we meditate. But we can do this, and it's something that we we know innately how to do, and that's what we need to remember. And that remembering uh, will give us so much peace and so much joy and so much, let the body absolutely relax into that. And it's very healing, very healing of all illnesses and, you know, the mental torment and the and the rush and the bustle of what you're doing. But it really, sometimes you just want to go and sit under a tree, under a tree and forget everything and be one with nature. Well, that's what you're doing. That's how you get there. But it, 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 it's just, it's once again a choice to be able to let it go. Yeah. Right. And I think that we, I, I really do think the, the Western civilization is, is transforming somewhat and and beginning to appreciate and really dive into into some practices that 
help them remember. And, and we don't have to look far to see indigenous cultures, ancient cultures who yeah. live like that, you know, with their children definitely involved. And what a beautiful thing if, if you know, we can just start going more towards that, that yeah. soulfulness, that love. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you think about how we can, or, you know, many say that when a child is six or seven or they begin school and they just stop remembering and except for maybe special times, you know, right before they go to sleep or something like that. And what do you think that we can do to help the young to maybe remember longer to help gain that inner strength? Because I think that's what this does for anyone you you become strong stronger and gentler and more loving and so what do you um, think one could do to help a child remember longer well I, I think it's the um knowing that child from the beginning and learning with the child learning how they go to sleep learning um their connection to the divine and if we don't have that openness in ourselves that openness and that connection that we can tap into it's going to be very difficult for us to remind them so in doing the doing the work with the children you're doing it with yourself you have to do it with for yourself first mm -hmm. you have to become what you want them to become and then by the time they get to seven and eight they only have to look in your eyes and you can remind them, you know, as I get to 17, 18, maybe it's a little bit different because they really don't want to know what mum knows, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you're always then that gentle reminder to them. So it's really working on yourself and going there yourself and being being brave enough to go in there to uh, just be your soul so they can see right through you too, as you can see through them. Right, right. And as you say, our children show us that it's okay to love, to love others, and to love the earth and its inhabitants. Ha inhabitants. They teach yeah. us how to trust all will be taken care of while we rest. They teach us to trust the divine as they do. And I know your son has been such, uh, I, I want to come over and meet him or maybe he can come <laughs> to the United States. <laughs> but let's... Um, I'd love to just chat about your son a little bit. Can you tell us about your journey with him? I know how difficult it was for him when, when your daughter passed. And can you just talk, talk a little bit about that and what has, I don't know, the two of you, how you've supported one another and, and once again, how he's been really one of your greatest teachers. Yeah, well, I realized that he wasn't going to make it in school, so I took him out and I homeschooled him, mm -hmm. as I did all my other children for a long time too. And, um, yeah, he he and I used to talk about this, you know, I'd teach him about maths and English, and um, but I'd also make sure that he learned about God's ways. And um, so we became very familiar with that. And um, he grew into the uh, understanding that that was happening every day, that that connection was happening every day. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, he's had, you know, had, we've had plenty of pets here, dogs, cats, and every time one would go, he would say, well, he's, he's up in heaven. And, um, yeah, and then, then another one would go, well, they can play up there now, can't they? Uh -huh. They're up in heaven. And um, and then when my daughter died, it was the same thing. Well, she's up there now. She can look after them, you know. So it, it just really, he just knew where she went, if you like. Right. And because uh, he has that connection. And it's, um, yeah, it's an amazing um, characteristic, I think, of his and he's he, he's so honest with it and he his face just lights up uh when you talk about it and um 
I asked him yesterday whether he minded if I talked about him and tell him the story, the stories of uh, when we talk about Jesus. No, that's all right, Mum, that's fine. So um, that would be good. So, he, he's, yeah, he was very, and he's been very involved with me getting this ready and very really? happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about then <laughs> that then because I, I mentioned I, I didn't know if we'd have time to, you know, jump into that. But let's let's talk about it and about <laughs> his relationship with, with Jesus. And yeah, tell us tell us a story. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, he loves Easter. He loves the Easter story. Yes. And um that's the one you want, that that story. Yes, yes. Okay. I love so, that story. Yeah, well, from a little boy. Um it was a big thing in our house, the, the Christian celebrations, and because I had to tell him what it meant. So he he listened to the story, and as he grew older, piece by piece, I'd tell him on Thursday what was happening, and then I'd tell him on the Friday what was happening, and the Saturday and Sunday it got to at the end. But he was very interested in the uh, story of uh how Jesus went out into the garden and everyone went to sleep and um, then the soldiers came and then because what got him excited was the soldier cut off, uh, Peter cut off the soldier's ear and because that was a bit of drama yes. and uh, and then picked it up and put it back on. And um, so he loved that part of the story. And um, then so... That goes all day Friday. We talk about that with him on the Thursday night and the Friday. And then on Friday, we usually sit outside around 3 o'clock when it was supposedly the time that Jesus passed and uh, we sit there and then it will just go deadly still. The whole of the surrounds, there's not a tree moving, not a leaf on a tree moving. And um, we just sit there and we look at each other. And he said, has it happened yet? And I said, yes, it's happened now. It's three o'clock. And then we just sit quiet. And then inevitably, every year we've done this, we'll get a short breeze that just wakens our faces, that just goes past us. And he says, that's Jesus walking past, telling us that he's alive. Oh. So <laughs> he leaves that breeze behind. Yeah. Yes. And you've said that recently it's become even more interesting for him because you, Jesus left the tomb alive and came to his friends, but he believes, or I will say he knows. Yes, <laughs> I'm gonna, yes, I'm gonna, I'm very gonna much. I'm going to change your word a little bit. <laughs> that his sister left to pass to and is alive with Jesus. That's oh, totally. So beautiful. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, and I think yeah. even for listeners that maybe they aren't Christian or maybe, I mean, any, any spiritual practice like this is just so, mm. is so amazing. And you, you say that it is in the sharing of our souls with our children that we both become teachers and students and yeah. that with, that's each, great, with each other, with each other. Mm. And what a great mm. example of you doing that. I'll say mm. spiritual practice every year. And I have a son who has special needs and, and anyone that, that has um, a loved one or someone that they know intimately, um, we all know how much they look forward to things. <laughs> yes. There's always a count. Yes. <laughs> There's always a countdown. I think the excitement before is more so. Oh, than yes. <laughs> So I think that's something else that maybe we should all live a little bit more, a little bit more yeah. like that with that, that yeah. excitement and, and, oh. and living, living in the present. Yeah. Yeah. He knows how to celebrate life. Yes. Yes. Mm. So what would you like to shout to the world? You, you are such a, oh. Just talking to you just makes me want to go into like a deep meditation. And um, you've talked about breaking the silence and recognizing that we all suffer, but how we must come to the realization that we all need to grab our souls and share every piece of ourselves. 
and to begin to survive and believe in ourselves. So maybe that's what you want to shout to the world. And I just said it. <laughs> can you, yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> can you elaborate just a little bit on that? Or would you like to? <laughs> well, it is. It's true. I think our souls are silent in this day and age. Yes. Uh, more so now, I think our souls are coming alive uh, within us. But I think that's the silence that needs breaking. We, we go through a silent uh, time and we keep our soul silent. And it, and it is, it's just breaking out and being brave enough to, to be that vulnerable with, with, your, with yourself mm. and, uh, and with others. And, and that's okay to, to be that way. And it's just really um, your soul is your love. And loving someone and, or loving uh, others is sometimes hard to do and it does cause, call for vulnerability. Um, but that's the part that, that, that needs to uh, not be silent anymore. We, we need to be able to be there. Mm -hmm. When I first introduced you also in your bio, you, you do talk about that before we come back to this earth, that we do have to go through the seven steps. Um, we don't have a uh -huh. whole lot of time, but could you could you um, just talk about that? The message of your of your book. Yeah. Um, well, as a counselor for many years, I realized that there were. Um, you know, we all have different issues, mm -hmm. but they all relate to the same thing. And we all seem to walk through these seven steps where, you, where you're silent, perhaps, or, or where you're hopeful or where you're, you, you know, you're suffering and you go through loss. And every one of us have to go through these stages uh, throughout life because everyone's going to either have a loved one that died or they're going to, there's something's going to um, happen in your life. Um, and I think the walking through the steps, when you get to the the part where it breaks you open, which is can be at the death as it was of my daughter, and it breaks you open, and and you, then you you reach a state then that you can either shut that down and say I'm not going to handle that, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to get vulnerable anymore, or you can go in your soul and become that person become that soul that you are and remain open and, and share that with others. And that's where the journey from counselling and realising these people were all saying the same thing but different ways. Um, but I didn't want it to be a textbook type of thing. I wanted it to be a story that we can all relate to. And um, But very much of my work is all connected in there and that's how I came to these steps because I noticed that that summed up my career, if you like, that each one of us passed through these stages. And, um, and it's our choice whether we come out in the end um, and, and be our soul or whether we don't want to. That's okay too. And then you just go back and you come back yeah, and you, you can have another go. <laughs> yes, yes. So it's really, it doesn't matter what choice you make. It's just um, matters to you how, yeah. how, you, how you're travelling and how you want to go through. Mm -hmm. And it, it just stops all judgment of people, if you like, because we're all the same. You know, it's so true. I never have really thought about that before, but every one of us, we do, we go through these seven steps and it's it's part of life and it's so profound to think that we have to do that in order as you say for our souls to break open and understand that we are not our bodies but we are eternal souls and we and we go home and we plan these things before because we have lessons that we we want to learn it's so hard sometimes though, isn't it? When it, it's just so painful, but, but you're right. If you come out, if you're able just to grow from that and trust and have faith, wow, the growth is just enormous. Yeah. Yeah. 
and it's all choice. It's yes. how far how far we want to go. Yeah. 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 So I know you work with children with disabilities, and that's certainly a, a passion of, of mine. And you even have worked in some remote areas. And tell what have the, the children with disabilities? What have they, well, it's just like your son, but what are um Tell us just a little bit about your work in that area. Yeah. Well, I think I think what you realise is each family is an individual family. Yes. And each family will handle a disability in a completely different way to what perhaps you or I would handle a disability. We, we all have our own ingrained um, family culture. Yes. And, um, you know, they, they, um, that that's probably was my biggest awakening when I went walked into the the life of people with disabilities and they the children or the people adults now with the disability they're not exempted from any of anything they they have to go through the seven steps just as much as we do right. and they and when that's the surprise if you like at that um they they are very much who we are, they are their souls, and they still have to walk the, um, the through the different steps. And some of them are silenced, and some of them uh, have a voice. Uh, you know, some of them live in hope, some of them live in despair. Um, and I've met a lot of them um, throughout throughout the time, and um, it has a profound impact on families um, when one child or members of the family have a disability mm -hmm. and um, we we don't see that the person that with the disability is disabled in any way it's just a person with a disability and when you put that into those terms they you still see them as souls you still see them as as suffering in certain ways and right. joyful in other ways and yeah, they're just a person with a disability and their soul has come to live this life. And I believe that's the, for, for, for as much for them as it is for us Absolutely. to live with somebody with a disability because it changes you. It changes who you are. Yeah. Yeah. So many, well, including Trevor, my nephew, um, who is disabled, um, all I can say is that the families I know, and I know our family, it's just something about that kid that just oozes out love from everyone, you know? Yes. He's like yes. an earth angel. And and it really brings you back to when you're talking about remembering and knowing and, and taking time to be quiet. You just spend some time with, with a person who... who um, has it is is a regular person just has some disabilities but wow what what a gift what a yeah. gift to they, all of us when we can spend yeah. time with those kinds of people yeah they've come for a different reason yes yes <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. but so, just as important oh oh if not more than more important mm -hmm. if you ask me so what what are your words of wisdom to to wrap up our our conversation today Ah, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I I did write something, and I you thought, well, yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's very real, and um, just a simple little story. Yeah. One day I was out and about in our little hometown, and um, I was driving along, and I could see this little dog running up the footpath, and then running across the road, and trying to, and only a little thing. And you could, you just knew that it had got out somewhere and it was trying to look for its owner. Mm -hmm. And the, the traffic was chaotic and the, the town was chaotic. And all I just, I just screamed at the angels and just get someone to get this dog. You know, it was, yes. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And I felt frustrated. Anyhow, I just had to leave it at that. Anyway, I went up round through the town and turned around at the intersection and came back and uh, everything seemed to just slow down for me it was just the 
was a sort of yellow tinge over everything and it looked like everything was in slow motion and I was driving through this and I could see just on the edge of the footpath that was on the road side um, this little dog's running along and this lady's running up to get it and almost had it and it was just like oh, thank you god it was just <laughs> he just slowed everything down yeah yeah and that's just how I live and that's the presence of God and that's just when you call, he answers and we'll look after a little dog if that's your problem. <laughs> and isn't it interesting, the more we trust and the more we take a second to, to go into that present moment and into that quiet, the more these things like happen all the time, you know? All the time. It's yes. just amazing. But if you're not <laughs> looking for them or if you're not quiet or if you're not trusting, maybe not so much, but they're always there. It, things like that are yeah. always happening. Yeah. And it's just it's just one call. And that's how close right. the, the divine is. Yes. yes. It's just one call. And they hear you and they do it. And, <laughs> you know, whoever it is you've called on. <laughs> yes, yes, whoever it is you've called on. Yeah. They uh, they. Yeah, and I just drove away peaceful that day. Right, right. That was Sm with a smile on your face and probably a tear in your eye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Al Alma, thank you so much. Have I? Is there anything that you would like to to say that I that I haven't asked today? No, I'm not particularly. I don't think. I think you've done it well. Thank you, Mara. Oh, you're very yeah. welcome. And if people want to find you, you know, I was I was thinking the other day. I don't know how I found you. I just, do you know where I found you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I, I have absolutely no idea, but I was so drawn. And then it took a little while to actually contact you. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but if people did want to learn a little bit more about you and your book, which will be mm -hmm. in the, all in the show notes, um, where would they look? Well, I, I, I am on Facebook and I'm on Twitter. Um, I also have a website. That's uh, becoming soul .com. Yes. And um, I have an email if someone wants to con contact personally, which is lelma becoming soul at gmail.com. Wonderful. And, and you're um, and you're writing a new book. I am. I am. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Great. And it's about um, about those with a, a disability. Yes. How yes. you need to communicate with those. Wow. Yes, yes. Exciting. Yes, it's very very much the rest of my story, if you like. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I can't mm. wait for that to come out. Well, thank yeah. you so much. It's just, it's really been a pleasure. I, I feel like we're sitting in the same room having a cup of tea. It's been <laughs> a pleasure chatting with you. And mm. um, you have a great rest of the day. I know it's in the morning in Australia. So yes. have, have a great day. Have a great day, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Mark. Thank you. Lovely. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening in today. If you want to learn more about the show, you can find us at interviewswithinnocence.com and on Facebook or Instagram at interviewswithinnocence. Please write me a message. Tell me what you liked and let me know what else you would like to hear. I would love to hear from you. And if you liked what you heard, please leave us an iTunes rating and review. It helps other listeners find the show. Thank you. Thank you.